Hi, everyone. This is the fourth lecture of week nine. And again, a reminder to please keep up with your readings from the biblical text and from Coogan. Okay. Uh, we are going to end our examination of the stories in the book of Judges with two stories that describe women as victims. And um, we're going to maybe talk about the reason why the book of Judges ends in this manner. Okay. Um, before we get to the end, however, um, we're going to backtrack a little bit uh, first to Judges 11 to talk about the story of Jephthah's daughter. Okay. In this story, we are told that Jephthah, a son of a prostitute, is driven out by his, his half-brothers and becomes an outcast. As an outcast, he collects around him, we are told, other outcasts, and they form kind of a game. Okay. And him, he and his gangs appear to be rather successful as we, we are told that he is approached by other people of the town that have just kicked him out to fight on their behalf against the Ammonites. Okay. And he agrees to do so, but he says that um, if he wins, that he is going to, they're going to have to make him their leader. Okay. Um, and of course, they agree. Now, uh, considering that if Jephthah succeeds, he will become, he will go from being a town outcast to a, the town like mayor or something. Um, you know, there's a lot writing on this battle. So what does he do? He makes a rash vow to God before this major battle. Okay. So this is the vow that he makes as described in Judges 11 verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's to be offered up by me as a burnt offering. Okay. This is, of course, a stupid vow, okay, a foolish vow. Okay. Um, because, uh, you know, as I stated in a previous video, I mean, who are the ones that greeted returning men from battle? Well. They're family members, right? Women and children, right? They were the ones who usually welcomed them back home. And of course, big surprise, that's indeed what happened, okay? Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mitzvah, and there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and with dancing. She was his only child. He had no son or daughter except her. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble for, to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, if you have opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has given you vengeance against your enemies, the Ammonites. Okay? Jephthah, and in the middle of this name is um, this word to open, patach. Okay, notice this onomatopoeic. So Jephthah, whose name means he who opens, probably the womb, okay, opens up his mouth stupidly, foolishly, to make a vow, vow which he cannot undo. And we, I've talked about vows before. And as a result, condemns his only daughter to be sacrificed, okay? Some have, and there's lots of different readings of the story, right, as with every story. Um, and some have argued that the story elucidates how war and fighting between men, how they create so many unnamed victims, right? Usually those who are female or, chi or uh, you know, children or, or those who are old, okay? That they're usually the frequent victims of the wars between men. Okay. Indeed, there are similar stories about child sacrifice in war, and, and the, the one that's very close to the story of Jephthah's daughter is the story of Ephigenia in Greek mythology. Again, there's this beautiful, actually, video on it, but whatever, okay. Um, hence, uh, notice that um, this story also kind of refers back, alludes back to the Isaac story, right, the Akedah. Okay, this is the second story where we have child sacrifice. However, notice the differences. God, in this case, unlike with Isaac, decides not to um, inter intervene, right? Notice how silent God is, okay? Um, and this is what happens in verse 37, okay? Uh, and she, that is Jephthah's daughter, who is unnamed, okay, said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Grant me two months so that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virgin, virginity, my companions and I. Go, he said, and sent her away for two months. So she departed, she and her companions, and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to the vow he had made. She had never slept with a man, so there arose an Israelite custom that for four days every year the daughters of Israel will go out to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. Okay, 
notice with the story, right? This is a replay of the Akeda, but with the variant ending. Okay, and notice the particular uh, vision of women that we have in this story. Okay, women as victims, yes, but also this idea of women as sacrifice. Okay, um, indeed, people have wondered whether the reason why Isaac's uh, story has such a different ending is because he is a man or he is male. Okay, so he deserves maybe to be saved from Moses, you know, while Jephthah's daughter is a female. Okay. Indeed, her gender, that is the fact that she is an unmarried virginal daughter, seems rather important to the story as it keeps mentioning this fact. Okay. And this repetition, Alice, well as the ending of the story where um, she is allowed two months of mourning with her friends, uh, mourning her virginity, right? This idea that this thing that she does becomes a kind of female custom in Israel. Okay. This has led some interpreters to argue maybe that this story is maybe not literal, it shouldn't be read literally, but kind of metaphorically, okay? It is not, they argue, that this daughter, that Jephthah's daughter is sacrificed or killed, per, like literally killed per se. Rather, according to this reading, this story is about uh, sort of this natural transition that women have to go through, especially in the ancient context, right? About how what a young woman has to go from her childlike state to being married off to a man here <laughs> envisioned as God, okay? Uh, who she doesn't choose, okay? Because of some stupid promise by her father. And how marriage, therefore, and becoming a wife and this progression, okay, is likened in the story to sacrifice, to death, like being killed and given up as an offering to a higher powered male deity, okay? If so, then the two months of time that she requests is kind of like a sad bachelorette party, okay, which might have been originally sadder, I don't know, a chance for young women to bemoan and lament and celebrate um, this big transition they're about to go, to, go through, okay? Now, again, it's a very complicated story. I've given you one interpretation. There are many others, right? But because of the time, I have to move on, okay? Um, this vision of women's life or women as sacrifice continues or is highlighted even more dramatically in the very last story that we find in Judges, in Judges 19 uh, through 21. Okay, and the story begins with the statement, okay, that keeps getting repeated as we near the end of the book of Judges. And it is this statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was good in their own eyes. And you'll see this uh, kind of ramp up as we get to the end of the book, okay? Um, and, and this seems to be in part to set up right, uh, you know, set judges up for the book that follows, and in particular, the coming monarchy, okay? And scholars widely debate whether this phrase, in those days there was no king, whether this is uh, envisions monarchy as a good thing or a bad thing, okay? Another way to put it is that judges sets up for the books of Samuel and Kings, which talks about the formation of kingship in Israel. And one of the ways it sets up for it is with the repetition of the, uh, this line, in those days there was no king. Okay. Um, now, the story of the Levite, Levite's concubine, which is found in the very last story in the book of Judges, in Judges 19 and 21, it begins with this concubine, uh, probably a second wife, Okay, of a man from the tribe of Levi, which is the priestly tribe, so keep that in mind. And we are told that she leaves her husband and goes back to her father's house in Bethlehem. Okay, and considering uh, what a dramatic act this would be, right, that a woman would leave her husband, um, notice that it hints of a very, very bad situation for the woman. Okay. Her husband, for whatever reason, seems to want her to return, however, and follows her to her father's house. And again, if you read this from a kind of modern abuse lens, this is also incredibly disturbing, okay? He seemingly persuades her to return, and after several days of partying with the wife's father, um, he and the concubine and the servant leave uh, the concubine's the father's house and head back to Ephraim, okay? During their travels, when they reach Jerusalem, um, evening starts to approach, and in the in the ancient world, um, you know, nighttime was a time of great danger, right? Remember, there was no, you know, there was probably not a lot of roads and certainly very little light. Okay, so they need to get out of there <laughs> when there is uh, when night falls. 
And so their servants suggest turning into Jerusalem for the night, not yet part of Israel. But of course, the Levite, we are told, refuses, thinking that as Jerusalem is not an Israelite town, it is not safe. Okay, instead, okay, they decide to turn into Gebeah, which is located in the tribe, in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, where they assume they would find better treatment because it is an Israelite town. <clears throat> and you want to start paying attention to the names here. When they get to Gebeah, they are given shelter in the house of an old man. And then the replay of the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative, okay, but without the miraculous intervention this time, we are told that just like then, a group of men show up to the house of the old man who has taken in the Levite and his company, and the man that the old man hand, you know, hand over the Levite so that the townsfolk can know him. Okay, the old man tells the man that he cannot do so as again, this is a flagrant disregard of the rules of hospitality. And like with Lot, the old man offers to throw out his daughter and also the concubine to the men instead. When the men fail to listen, as they always do, the Levite, however, does this, verse 27. Okay, I mean, sorry, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 25 and following. But the men would not listen, so the man, sees his concubine and put her out to them. And they wantonly raped her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And in the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house. And when he, uh, when he went, and when he went out to go on his way, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up. He said to her, we're going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man set out for his home. The Levite, the priestly tribe, this man from the, uh, the, the, uh, the, sorry, the tribe of Levi, throws out his concubine to men who presumably rape and torture her till the morning. The next morning, we're told, the woman seemingly tra tries to crawl back to the house of, it says, her Lord. <laughs> Okay, as the text states, but she falls down at the door with her hand on the threshold. Okay, notice how this text does not state when she died, so she may be not dead at this point. Her husband, we're told, you know, uh, gets up in the morning and with a complete lack of care tells her to get up so they can get going, you know, and when she offers no response, he hoists her on their animal and goes home. Okay, notice the, the horrifying portrayal of this Levite, okay? And of course, what this is supposed to show is how badly things have gotten in Israel, that it's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. We are told that when the, when the Levite reaches his house, he cuts off the body of his concubine into 12 pieces and sends it to the 12 tribes of Israel to call them to gather for war. And this kind of vivid section of her body, which may be the point that she dies, Okay, um, this will both start and symbolize the beginnings of the kind of vivid section of the Israelite national body as the tribes now go to the go to war against the tribe of Benjamin, of which Gilead is a part. Okay, or, or Gibeah is a part. Okay, and what they do is they war against the tribe um, in which this kind of town uh, is situated. Okay, and puts the entire tribe under the ban, which means they have to destroy all the Okay, all the Benjaminites, okay? Now, initially, we are told, and again, I am, again, kind of squashing down what is a very rich and long narrative. Please read the text, okay? Initially, we are told that the Benjaminites are rather successful at holding off the Israelites because of their left-handed ambidextrous abilities. They're very skilled militarily, okay? However, the Israelites at the end are able to defeat them, okay? Indeed, they are so successful to Israelites that we are told that the coalition of the other Israelite tribes succeeds in nearly killing off the entire tribe of Benjamin, okay? And when they realize they've nearly annihilated one entire tribe, they start weeping and lamenting, okay? Okay, they realize they're gonna go from 12 to 11, okay, tribes of Israel, okay? To make matters worse, all the tribes have, all the members of the uh, various tribes of the coalition have all taken vows not to marry any of their daughters to the Benjaminites. So now they're stuck with this big problem. There are leftover Benjaminite men with no one to marry, okay, and a tribe near the point of extinction. So we are told 
the Israelite coalition <laughs> thinks up two bad plans, okay? The first plan. We are told that there is a town which did not show up to battle the Benjaminites called Yabesh Gilead. And you want to remember the name of this town, okay? We are told that the Israelites put this town under the ban, that is, they kill everybody, all the people, all the animals, except the virgins in this town, who then are uh, given over to the Benjaminites to marry as wives. Okay. However, the problem is there's not enough women in this town uh, to give to all the Benjaminite leftover Benjaminite men. Okay, so the Israelite coalition comes up with another brilliant idea. Okay, and this is described in verse nine. So they said, "Look, the yearly festival of the Lord is taking place at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon." And they instructed the Benjaminites, saying, Go and lie and wait in the vineyards and watch. And when the young women of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards and each of you carry off a wife for himself from the young women of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. Then if their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain, we'll say, eh, be generous and allow us to have them because we did not capture in battle a wife for each man. But neither did you incur guilt by giving your daughters to them. And the Benjam Benjaminites did so. Okay, the Israelites tell the Benjaminites that there is this like kind of May Day festival at Shiloh, an old cultic site. Okay, Shiloh, remember again this name. Okay, and that young women are going to come out to celebrate during this May festival. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and this is what the Benjaminite men are told to do. They are told by the Israelites, okay, to go and steal and kidnap a woman from this festival, take her home, uh, and make her their wife. Okay, now. Disturbingly, interestingly, some cultures before marriage reenact the kind of kidnapping, okay, which makes you wonder about the origins of marriage, right? And especially what it looked like in the ancient period, but okay. Uh, furthermore, the Israelites tell uh, the Benjaminites, now if the father of these women say, what the hell, you know, are you kidnapping my daughter? The Israelites are going to all come out and say, yeah, yeah, come on, let's just be nice, let's just be friends, okay? And this is how <laughs> the book of Judges ends. Okay. So why does Judges end with this horrific tale? Okay. First, um, notice the gender component. Okay. Notice how these women, how this portrayal of women, okay, uh, as leaders and warriors and prophets at the be very beginning of Judges, how it kind of descends at the end. Okay. Where now at the end of Judges, women are turned into simply victims of war, rape, marriage, Okay, women at the end are envisioned um, kind of simply as conduits of power for men. And as the rape of one, one woman leads to not only the civil war, but the rapes of many women at Shiloh and Yabesh Gilead. Okay? Moreover, the destruction of the feminine is, notice how, again, is both a means to divide and also a means to unify. Again, conduits of power relationships among men. Okay. Interestingly, it is through the second giving of women, the second victimization of women to the Benjaminite men that the rift in Israel caused by the rape of the concubine is healed. The remaining Benjaminites all get wives through force and everybody returns home happy, we are told. Okay? Women thus are pictured as sacrifices of sorts, right? literally in the sense of the concubine who is cut up like a sacrifice, and of course the other women who are forcefully given to the Benjamin, Benjaminite men, um, notice how they're also envisioned as sacrifices, right? needed to heal the rift in Israel. Women thus become a means to both induce chaos and also the means to reassort order. Okay, a role which, as we saw with the creation uh, myths, right, they usually fill in these foundation stories. Okay, there is a second aspect to this tale which I mentioned earlier, right? Its connection to the coming monarchy. As I stated early uh, in the beginning of this very, uh, video, this story begins with this refrain: "In those days, there was no king; everyone did what was good in their own eyes." And in this line, in the context of this horrific story, where Israel uh, seems to really have gone to the toilet, right? Um, initially seems a pro-monarchic, okay? The story is about how, you know, things were such crap, you know, during the times of the judges that they needed a king, okay? However, there's little clues in the story, in the story in Judges 19 and 21, that indicate that this is not simply pro-monarchic or anti-monarchic, uh, but actually anti-King Saul and pro-King David, 
Okay, and of course, this would make sense considering who edited the Deutermistic history. Okay, there are all these clues in this final story in Judges that seem to target Saul. Okay, not only does the rape happen in the territory of Gebeah, a Benjamin, a town so associated with Saul that it is called Gebeah of Saul. Okay, but notice that the town that is put to the ban, okay, Yabesh Gilead so that they can find wives for the Benjamites. Notice that this town is um, a town that Saul will rescue as one of his first acts, and indeed maybe is what leads to him becoming king. Okay. Moreover, Saul, like the Levite, uh, too, will cut up a bull, cut up a living object into 12 pieces to call Israelite to war. Lastly, it is because of this concubine fiasco that Saul, when he meets Samuel, tells him that he comes from the smallest tribe in Israel. Well, Saul comes from the smallest tribe in Israel because Benjamin is nearly annihilated here in the end of Judges. Okay? Indeed, Saul's mother must either be from, there's only two towns that Saul, a Benjaminite, right, uh, where his mother could be from, either Yabesh Gilead or from Shiloh. Okay? Hence, another way to read this narrative is that it is not about the need for a monarch but about how Israel needs the right monarch. That is someone who is not Saul, okay? And hence the story nicely sets up for the story of Saul that begins the next book, okay? Uh, not only does the story set the scene, but notice how it prejudices and nudges the reader, signaling to the reader how Saul's reign is going to fail and hinting that Saul's reign is a continuation, not much better than this chaotic period of the judges. Okay, and in so doing, what the writer is really doing, right, what is setting the context, not necessarily for Saul, but for the reign of Saul's usurper, David, who despite being a usurper, is now portrayed by the biblical propagandists, right, as the only true king, perhaps even the first true real king of Israel, not Saul.